I went and I post that to my Buffalo YouTube account, so that's what you're going to see link. If we so if we have live or not live weeks, it'll be recorded regardless. So you'll always have that access to the recording unless there's a technological issue, which does happen from time to time. Um, with uh, respect to the current situation, so last year and the year before were the first two years where I sort of hybridized my course, where I took it half online, half in person, and then with COVID, everything went online. So for me, it was a really easy transition last spring because I just put all my stuff online. Now we're in a little bit of a different scenario, right? So we've got all the precautions in place, but I think, you know, wise <laughs> wisdom would say that the less exposure to various people inside of a building is probably good. So uh, I'm going to kind of dip my toes in the waters here and see how things go. I'm not super nervous. I think we have good precautions and everything like that. But at the same time, I do work in a hospital. Um, one case could you know, make this whole thing not work. So that, those are my personal kind of concerns with this. And I've talked to them about Wally, talked to them with Wally and all that stuff. So my point in saying this is I don't really know how much of, of in-person you're going to get with me this semester. We'll try it out. And I think especially for those first couple modules, we'll see how it goes. Um, so what I'm going to do, my plan is, is that basically every content lecture will be recorded in advance for you. So we won't really be doing any lecturing with the exception of this one probably in person. Um, so what the next time we'll meet will probably be before the exam, the week before the exam, and we'll do like an in-person review session of some kind, give you a chance to go through the modules, and we can talk over some of the points. Um, I am available by email if you want to do like a call or something with me like that. If you're really struggling, I'm open to that, and I can certainly schedule that. So feel free to reach out to me directly if you want to go over some more stuff or you feel like you're not getting it or it's not making sense. Infectious disease is honestly probably the hardest thing we're going to cover throughout the whole course. So you kind of hit the ground running with me. And um, the problem is there's just so many different disease states you have to talk about. But some of it overlaps, some of it's different. So that's the, the tricky part. So it is a pretty challenging module to start off with. So I want to make sure you guys feel like I'm not just, you know, in the cloud somewhere. I, I'm here. I can, you know, I could make extra sessions. I can do whatever, you know, we feel like we need to. So I am flexible. I, I live in Plymouth, so it's not too far for me to get in here. And I work in Minneapolis, so I can kind of make an L and come over here on my way home. It's pretty easy to get here. So that being said, um, you've got your lectures posted for this week. I'm not going to go through either of them. The, the, uh, the full content's recorded. Um, I'm going to go through the introduction lecture today, and then I might just field some questions you guys might have about infectious disease and then talk about some of my thought processes and how I think at least for this module, to approach it and how to be successful in it. All right, so uh, we'll talk about the course a little bit more and some of the stuff, but um, they, I've given you a little bit of my background. I live in Plymouth, like I said. I was a Bethel grad in 2007. Any Bethel grads in here? A couple, cool. Anybody have a pharmacy background by any chance, like tech or work in a pharmacy? No one? OK. Usually there's one. I always get a little nervous. <laughs> it's like, well, what if I say something? Uh, so uh, if we don't prescribe that anymore, that drug's been off the market for four years. Well, you know, sometimes in hospital medicine, you miss out on some of the outpatient stuff and, and vice versa. So forgive me if I, if I mix something up here or there, but I try to keep up to date. Um, anyway, I have two kids. That's Elliot and Lola. Um, this is older pictures. So Elliot's starting kindergarten this year, which is... Um, probably my, my number one anxiety source right now. If anybody is in the same group with kids in school, I'm sure some of you are, it's uh, interesting. And for me being my first experience with uh, being a parent in the public education system, it's a little nerve wracking. So we'll see how that goes because I don't understand how you can do kindergarten distance, but we'll see. <laughs> um, anyway, so with that, you know, and then Lola's, uh, she's three and a half, so she's got some time. So she'll miss all this fun stuff, uh, fortunately for her. So anyway, that's me. Um, I, by the way, so I, anyway, I, I'll give you more background. I went to Bethel, went to U of M for pharmacy school right after I graduated. Uh, I did a one-year residency at Abbott Northwestern. I practiced at Abbott Northwestern for the last, like, eight years, nine years of count residency. And so my area, of, primary areas of expertise are emergency medicine and behavioral health is where I clinically practice. But as a pharmacist, you just kind of have to be a generalist. I staff out of our main pharmacy a lot, too. And a few years ago, I transitioned my role from more clinical to more operations focused. So I actually work a lot with the hospital operations team and uh, our operations department within the pharmacy, just trying to optimize how we move medications around the pharmacy when you have a 
600 bed hospital with a super busy OR, there's a lot of drug that gets pumped through. You know, we have millions of dollars worth of drug on hand any day. We go through, you know, $50 million of drug a year. So there's a lot of money and uh, budgets and things like that that have to be looked at too. So kind of my expertise now is more optimizing the way that medications get to the patient, making sure that providers and nurses and so on and so forth have access to what they need at the bedside in the most convenient form. So I work a lot with like our technician staffing and delivery structures and procurement and that kind of stuff. So I found that when I was in school, if you would ask me if I had ever done this, I would say no. Um, I would never be an operations person because that's boring. Clinicals where it's at, um, but the more I kind of dabbled in it, the more I actually really liked sort of the long-term projects and um, the ability to sort of use the strategic part of your brain, which you can use clinically, of course, too. Um, but you know, I like what I've done with it so far, and um, I still staff in our emergency department from time to time, but not as much as I used to. So I'm like quasi-clinical, but sort of have left that arena. Anyway, so. Um, you have a access to a couple different things. So the Moodle site you guys are familiar with. Um, of course, flexibility, I already talked about that. You've already experienced that. Lucky you guys. Guest speakers, I don't have any guest speakers lined up right now. Every year I have a guy named George who I went to school with. He comes in and does a talk on HIV. He's a really good speaker. He's got a lot of good expertise. I think people enjoy listening to him. I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to do that. I might see if he can record his content and put it online for you guys because um, I think it's valuable. HIV is not a huge part of any exam. It's a very specialty area. And um, while he covers some other antiviral topics that are more common, like let's say HSV or something like that, um, his expertise is more in like the specialty type stuff. So I certainly wouldn't expect anyone to be an expert in specialty areas uh, coming out of PA school. That's more something you would you'd get over time working in a specialty area or any type of school. I should, should, I'm not picking on PAs. Pharmacy, medical, whatever. You aren't going to be an expert in the specialty field right out of graduation. I won't expect you to be able to prescribe HIV medications, but I do think it's an interesting topic to, to learn. And he's a good resource that I have access to. So I'll try and see if I can schedule that within the next couple of weeks, but I need to talk to him and confirm for sure. Uh, my exams are all online. They're all on through the eMedley system. They're all multiple choice, so they're just basic questions. Um, anything from like kind of a standard, what's the mechanism of action question, pick a side effect type of thing, uh, all, to, all the way to cases that are more complicated and ask you to make more therapeutic decision making. So, um, but they're always the same. They're four questions, multiple or four multiple choice options. Um, and usually my exams are between 40 to maybe up to 50 questions per exam. Uh, cases, so the cases structure has changed. I used to do in-person cases and then people didn't like those. Then I switched to more of like an online kind of do-it-yourself case format. And then last spring, what I did was I changed my cases to the, the structure you see now, which are the quizzes um, that you do once a week. And I think people like those overall. It's a good checkpoint. And especially with more stuff being online, I think Wally and myself and everybody else feels more comfortable knowing that, you know, you guys have that weekly check-in. So if I didn't give you that and just gave you, you know, four weeks of content, what are the odds maybe somebody might if you were me <laughs> back in school, you might just say, ah, I'm not going to do pharmacy this week. I'll do it next week. And then all of a sudden you've got all this stuff to catch up on. So not that I'm a huge procrastinator, but, you know, I definitely had my moments. So um, I think this keeps us all accountable. And um, again, try to be really clear that I don't grade these. Uh, again, I might spot check some answers here or there just to make sure people are doing them. But you will get credit for whatever you put in there. It's more or less just trying to get for you to get something out of it, to think through some of the concepts. And um, again, that's that's the purpose of those there. The textbook. So if you have purchased the textbook and haven't opened it or use it and you don't want it or want to save some money, feel free to return it. Um, not that I'm against the textbook, but it's very technical in some aspects, and I think it's more information than you probably need. You don't need the textbook to uh, succeed in my course at all. I don't teach out of the textbook. It's a supplementary reference. So my, inf my test questions come directly from my lecture content and my slides. So. I won't pull anything out out of the textbook that I didn't cover ever. Actually, I don't even know if I own a copy of the most recent version. I did use it when I built the course originally and kind of used some of their structure there. Um, but again, there's a lot of interesting and uh, physiologically technical aspects of pharmacology that they go over in the textbook that simply we don't have time for. Um, my goal is to give you guys kind of a really snapshot approach to pharmacology medicinal chemistry, that kind of stuff, but try and focus as much as we can on the therapeutic side of things so that you guys can be competent prescribers when you go out into the world and write prescriptions. So I want you guys to know drugs well, 
want you to know some of the background, but you don't know exactly how all the receptors work on a cellular level at the end of the day. Does that really matter? Does anyone, if you went and surveyed the average pharmacist, PA or MD, would they know that? Maybe, maybe not. So um, I'm not trying to say it doesn't matter because it's good background to have, but at the end of the day, we don't have the time to cover all of that uh, in the short amount of time we have together. So do you may have any questions about the course setup or structure or anything like that? Anything that's been unclear in syllabus or like that? Okay. All right, so uh, what are we covering? Drugs, obviously. So pathophysiology, pharmacology, kind of talk about names, classes, mechanisms, of action, indicated, safe, effective. Those are kind of the core concepts of this course. Talk about things like adverse drug reactions, drug interactions, uh, kind of random clinical pearls about medicine in general. And then the big thing, the disease state synthesis. So talk about all these medications for blood pressure. Well, how do you treat blood pressure? What do the guidelines say? Where do you start? How do you titrate? What do you change? Those are the important things to pick up. Um, I don't know if my YouTube lecture or my, my YouTube video works anymore. Somebody might have taken it down because of copyright infringement. Uh, dang it. All right. <laughs> um, it was just uh, for the Seinfeld fans out there. It's just Jerry Seinfeld talking about pharmacists and making fun of them. So <laughs> you can probably find it online. But I think um, what, what a side note of this class is that I would like to do is to be able to give you guys a, a window into my world a little bit and the value I think that my profession offers to the medical world. Um, I'm certainly not not thinking pharmacists are the best and know everything, but I do think that we you know we have a unique perspective that we bring into medicine, and um, certainly in all the that, all the aspects I work, the most rewarding job that I have probably from a clinical perspective is getting to work side by side with you guys or physicians or NPs or, or nurses or whoever it may be to make those clinical decisions to help solve an interesting problem. Um, that's really rewarding for me to bring, bring my expertise into that and to be able to, even if it's just you coming to me thinking you know the answer and saying, hey, what do you think about using this? Is that correct? And I can say, yeah, that's a great idea or no, let's try this. So um, bouncing ideas off pharmacists, using your pharmacist resources in whatever practice setting you go into, certainly something I want to make sure you guys uh, get from me, get that message from me. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what relationship or what uh, um, what facet of healthcare you're working in. There's a pharmacist accessible really in any aspect, whether it's your Walgreens pharmacist that you send a lot of prescriptions to, whether it's the pharmacist that works in the emergency department sitting right next to you. Um, you know, develop those relationships, talk to your pharmacist, call, ask questions. Asking questions up front saves most people a lot of headache later down down the road. So, just recommend that. Uh, did Jess Tonder still do a lecture this summer? No? Okay. Um, I don't really remember what she used to cover. She used to kind of do an intro lecture about like prescribing and things like that, but I don't know. Maybe they, they I'll ask Alicia and see if there's something different. But Okay. Anyway, I don't think it's critical to, to whatever we're talking about, but I was just curious. Okay. So what is pharmacology and how do I view like the science of pharmacy and, and what we're going to talk about? There's a couple different things. Uh, medicinal chemistry and pharmacology, and then pharmacotherapy. So medicinal chemistry is basically structure-activity relationships. So you look at the structure of a molecule and say, well, this structure interacts with this structure in the body, whether it be a receptor or an enzyme or something like that, and causes some sort of thing to happen. Okay, they don't care. <laughs> so medicinal chemists like just want to make stuff happen. Sure, there should be some sort of, you know, down the stream therapeutic application to this, but I think that's where a lot of times there's a disconnect between these two is you've got chemists that design molecules to do things and then you need to link that into therapy somehow. So a medicinal chemist might make something that that, cause, that interacts with a certain type of receptors, but does that actually produce a physiological response that's enough to make a clinical difference? That's the real question. So that's where pharmacology comes into play. Pharmacology is really the study of physiologic responses to medicinal agents. It sounds pretty good in, in and of itself, right? So you have a medicinal agent that's designed by a med chemist, and then the pharmacologists study it to see if um, the response is something that maybe could have a clinical application. And then you need to apply that to actual medicine and say, okay, well, this drug interacts with, let's say, a beta receptor on the heart, decreases heart rate. So how do we apply that clinically? Is there even a clinical application to that? Does this decrease heart rate enough in a large pool of patients 
that it causes a clinically significant outcome in the end. And that's where pharmacotherapy comes in. It's looking at all the evidence, looking at the actual medications themselves, and deciding uh, the best course of action for the patient. So that's really where we're going to focus on that last part. I will never test you on a structure or anything like that. Um, we're beyond that, I think, in our in our um, uh, schooling at this point, I hope. Um, so, and again, structures this, at this point, they, they aren't really relevant. Occasionally I show them off just for fun, um, but it's more or less to illustrate a specific point, not necessarily to, to test you on anything like that. So you'll never see a structure on one of my exams. Again, we're gonna focus heavily on that pharmacotherapy component of things. Okay, so all the drugs we have on the market uh, come from different places. I think you might be surprised that a lot of medications are actually de derived from natural sources. Um, so they might be biologic in nature. They might be mimicking a biologic product. They might be um, a synthetic version of something that was isolated from a plant. So a lot of things do have natural sources. I think we get under the impression that every drug we use is some sort of, uh, you know, chemistry lab concoction that we made that isn't natural at all. Well, a lot of them are actually designed to mimic our endogenous systems or they're designed to mimic something naturally that's found that has an effect on the body. So it's kind of interesting if you actually break it down and look at all the different sources of meds. Here's a fun example that I like to share. It's a drug called exenatide or Bieta. It's a um, type 2 diabetes medication, hypoglycemic agent, that's taken uh, chronically. And there's a number of different versions of it, but it was actually isolated from the venom of a Gila monster um, or a Mexican beaded lizard, which is a poisonous lizard that lives in the southwest U.S. And they found something in its venom. Some smart, again, med chemist probably was looking at venom samples or something like that. I think this would be probably a really cool job if you had it, at least for me anyway, um, to be able to do this kind of stuff and find compounds that actually might have some physiologic value. So interesting stuff. But so just to, again, highlight that point, the drugs come from all sorts of different sources. There's some really cool natural things that have inspired medication development. Uh, the dark side of pharmacy, big pharma. Uh, we always tell, we have joke with our colleagues whenever I have somebody who, you know, gets poached by a, a drug company from our hospital team. Um, they go and they become like a, what's called an MSL or a medical science liaison, I think is what that stands for, medication science liaison. They basically help with like research for drug companies, so they do lots of things, but I always make fun of them and say they're going to the dark side because the money's good. It's a really cushy job. Anyway, that's all I'll say. <laughs> uh, so you have um, a couple different things to talk about with Big Pharma, and we'll go through how drugs are approved here and the different stages of clinical trials because it's really important to understand this um, from a prescriber perspective, and especially when you're reading literature about new and upcoming drugs, knowing if something's in stage two or stage three, what does that mean exactly? Um, this is just an example of the top medications by sales and prescriptions. I can't find more recent data than this. Usually this comes out yearly, but it seems like the source Medscape. Medscape's a good resource for a lot of medical different stuff, including drugs. But it's got, um, they usually post this every year, and I can't find the more updated one. Anyway, so the point is, is that there's a lot of money spent on drugs a year. And so you see like some of these medications are, it's just sort of interesting to see what we're spending our money on in the US. So Humira is a medication used for a lot of autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Why is it such a huge money maker? Are there that many people with those diseases? Technically, no, if you compare them to like hypertension or cholesterol or diabetes, no. It's a really small portion of people. However, the drug itself is super expensive. You have a biologic agent. We'll talk about biologic agents more throughout the course. But basically, two different types of drugs out there. There's small molecule biologics. Small molecule are kind of the traditional medications you might think of. Tylenol, ibuprofen, metoprolol, warfarin, whatever it might be. Anything that comes in a tablet form is probably a small molecule drug. I mean, it's just kind of basic structure, interacts with a couple different receptors in the body. Um, biologic agents are usually peptide chains, proteins, enzymes, things like that are designed to mimic those things. And they're designed very specifically to link into certain or to work with very specific areas in the body. So the cool thing about them is they don't have a lot of side effects because they don't get into other systems in the body. They pretty much stick to one area. The bad thing is, is that it's expensive to make them. You can't just, you know, whip up a batch of the chemical, put it into a tablet form and, and stamp them out and run them down a conveyor belt. Um, you have to actually grow the protein and develop it that way. So the processing is expensive. And um, there's been a lot of huge barriers to getting generic alternatives to the market. Talk more a little bit about generics in a, in a few slides here. But the point is, is that you have 
um, patents with medications. So if you have a brand name medication as a drug company, you usually get 20 years on your patent from the time you file for it. About 10 years of that is usually soaked up in the clinical trials. So by the time you get to market, you're left with about 10 years of actual money-making potential when it comes to medications. Now, because biologics have an, a little bit different in nature, it's been very difficult for generic companies to argue that they could replicate them. So biologics for a while had basically indefinite patents. Um, I believe under the Obama administration, maybe in 2014 or 2012, somewhere around there, they actually passed some legislation allowing for what's called biosimilar products that come to market. But the problem with these, it's not that they aren't good, they're fine, we use them. You only get about 20% cost savings. So if your drug costs $1,000 a month, the biosimilar is $800. It's still really expensive. Whereas a small molecule drug that's brand new might cost $300 a month, brand, when it goes generic after it's been on the market for a while and you get five different generic manufacturers then entering the market causing competition, you end up with $10 a month. So your savings with generic small molecules are huge versus these biosimilars just because they're very expensive to make. A lot of manufacturers will not even bother getting into the market because it's so expensive to make them and the, the margins aren't as good. They'd rather make lisinopril because they can sell which is a blood pressure medication that like a million people, 20, 30 million people take. Um, it's, you know, that's a huge market and you have to sell a lot of volume there, but it's easy to do that. So that's one of the struggles we get in with um, some of the pricing of medications and why some of these things are really high, like Enbrel is another one. Um, insulins, who's heard about insulins on the news being overpriced and all that stuff? It's been a hot button. Our senator, uh, Amy Klobuchar, has been really uh, kind of on a war path with this recently. And one of the really just interesting comments, not to get political at all, but you have um, insulins that really haven't changed in decades. They're the, basically the same thing we had on the market 30 years ago. Um, Lantus has been around for a really long time. But the price gets jacked up significantly every year without any new research or development going on. So you have drug companies that argue very heavily that, well, if you cut our pricing or you restrict the amount of money we can spend, then I can't put that back into my research and development. Therefore, I can't make new drugs. So you want me to make new drugs? Great. But you have to allow me to sell my medications at, at the prices I want. And so that's a, a big argument with the whole um, pricing structure that we have currently in the U.S. But you have something like that where Sanofi probably maybe is trying to use Lantus to prop up some of their other businesses. So they try and use some of their moneymakers. But certainly there's lots of profits in there too. So it gets a little, again, there's a lot of ethical discussions you could have here, but just kind of giving you a snapshot picture of, of what this industry is like. Um, other medications on here, Harvoni. Uh, Harvoni, you might have seen commercials for, is a hep C medication. Hep C is a, like, again, in the grand scheme of things, not a common thing that people get. Um, Harvoni is really expensive because, again, the drug company Gilead will say that it's a cure. It does cure Hep C. Um, so you take it for a couple years, maybe a year, and your Hep C's gone, which is pretty cool. Um, it's before we had drugs like Harvoni, which are relatively new um, to the system, um, there wasn't anything like that. If you had Hep C, you basically took like interferon to make your immune system work differently so that you could fight off the causes of it, but your risk for cirrhosis and complications like that was significant. With the new drugs like Harvoni, and there's a number of new ones out there that have come out in the last couple of years, um, they're basically offering a cure. So they say, well, think about it this way. If I give a patient, if I come to market with a new anti-cholesterol medication, a patient might have to take that for life um, after they have a heart attack or something like that, or if they just have high cholesterol. If I come to market with Harvoni, that's great, but a patient takes it for two years and they're done. Now, I'm happy that my patients are living, but I don't get to make any money off of that. So um, what they're trying to do, if you look at it, is they condense all those profits into a narrow point of time compared to, you know, 30 years. They're trying to make back their money. Um, so it's, again, it's very interesting to see what we spend our money on. And again, it's not that these drugs are more common. It's that they're just really expensive. Now, if we flip this and look at some of the top prescriptions, we see a lot of generic medications that have been on the market for a while and are quite cheap. So level thyroxin, lisinopril, atorvastatin, um, cholesterol, thyroid, blood pressure, um, acetaminophen, hydrocodone, yeah, U.S. and opioids, <laughs> number four prescribed medication in the country. Um, so we, we do um, a lot of that as well. Uh, you've got metoprolol, blood pressure, amlodipine, blood pressure, metformin, diabetes, um, omeprazole, 
heartburn, stomach acid, Prilosec brand name. So a lot of basic stuff. You have volume prescription, but again, this volume can't even touch the, the cost on the other side. So a little bit interesting just to look at uh, how we, what we spend our money on and what we're prescribing in the country, I think. Uh, and just this is some information from Express Scripts. Express, Express Scripts is a pharmacy benefit um, provider. And so um, they uh, post data and stuff. So what they're spending their money on per condition. And these inflammatory conditions, like again, RA, Crohn's, where you've got these expensive biologics, are taking the cake because um, the drugs are really good. They, they improve quality of life massively for these patients, uh, but they're, they're pricey. So there you go. Okay, so how do, exactly do we get a drug from a uh, chemical phase to market? Uh, well, you have to discover something and prove that it's both safe and effective. So to do that, first you usually have some preclinical testing. So you find a, a molecule that might have some physiologic effect. You do some lab animal testing, human testing, submit an, what's called an IND with FDA. So it's an investigation new drug application. If the FDA approves that, that's when your 20 years starts. And then you can start going into phase one clinical trials. Phase one is usually healthy volunteers. I think of like college students volunteering for this kind of stuff at big research uh, research universities. Usually it's small, so like 20, 80, maybe 100 people, not much. All you're trying to do in phase one is prove that the drug is relatively safe, so it doesn't cause some sort of a detrimental side effect, which should make whoever is volunteering for these really feel good. But hopefully it's been tested somewhat in animal models before this, so there's lower risk, but still never tested in humans. So. Certainly there's a, a paid volunteer aspect here that's important. Um, and then you're looking at the kinetics of the drug. So if you watch the kinetics lecture from last week, um, how does the drug get processed through the body? Is it metabolized by the liver? Is it renally uh, eliminated? Do we know how long it lasts? So you're measuring titrating blood concentrations to see how long the drug lasts. The idea is to get through phase one and have a relatively safe drug with no unacceptable toxicity or apparent toxicity, and then proceed to phase two with a dosing strategy that you've also determined from phase one. Now, the problem is, is that you're testing young, healthy people for the most part. So when you bring that into a elderly population or a population with kidney disease or you know whatever have you, you end up with a whole different group of variables that you didn't check for in phase one. That's just the way the system's designed. Uh, phase two is looking primarily at efficacy you still look at things like safety and short-term side effects and those types of things. Um, obviously, you can't get long-term effects in a, in a short period of time, so we, we don't have any idea about that at this point. Um, the, does the drug work in people who have a certain disease or condition? So this is a more focused approach looking at a specific group of people that have a disease and is it actually effective for treating them. Um, usually, they're placebo-controlled. Depending on the disease, sometimes they might be against the, the existing standard of care, but a lot of times we see placebo-controlled trials. And looking at a relatively small group of people, depending on the disease and depending on how rare it is or how common it is, you might have 50 to 300 subjects. If good, at, decent evidence of effectiveness is shown, you proceed to phase three. Phase three are a large scale, scale study. So basically, you just want to confirm what you found in phase one and two in a big group of people. And you want to make it so you have enough numbers as far as people go to get statistically significant results. Because when you publish this, you want it to sound good uh, from a drug company perspective. You also want to look at things in different populations. A lot of times phase three clinical trials are, are multi-center, meaning they are at numbers of hospitals, not only in the US, but all over the world usually. So you usually see data coming in from a lot of different diverse populations, which is really good um, from one perspective, because we're not just testing you know, like Scandinavian people. Um, we want to test all types of different people um, from different ethnicities because Genetic polymorphisms can vary, liver enzyme processing can vary, disease rates can vary. Um, there's a number of variables that are important to consider there. When you have um, the other, the flip side of that though, is you might say, well, if they're testing in developing countries, are there ethical implications to that? And are they going around government restrictions and are they doing it to a level that's required by US? But to make sure the study is intact, they have to follow the same protocols in every single country and every single center they do it in. So Theoretically, it's, it's, it should be following specific procedures, but certainly there's, there's a potential risk there. Um, they might test it in some different indications. So they might say, well, we found some stuff come out in the phase one and two that might be promising for this. Let's try it for a different indication. They might try different doses to see what's the most effective. 
Uh, they might try it in combination with other drugs that are standard of care or head to head against other drugs. So one example is within the last 10 years, the, the anticoagulant warfarin or Coumadin um, is what's kind of the king of anything related to anticoagulation. So whether you're treating a venous thromboembolism a, um, or uh, atrial fibrillation, trying to prevent clots from forming and stroke, that was the, the gold standard. So 10 years ago, a bunch of drugs came out on the market that are competitors to it. And um, they have actually been shown to be really good, but there are a lot of different drug trials related to those specific medications. Now, if those medications tried themselves against placebo, no one would take them seriously because you don't treat, you know, VTE, venous thromboembolism, um, with an anticoagulant or placebo. That makes no sense. So you have to treat it against the standard of care and prove that it's at least not inferior to what we're already using. So you'll see stuff like that in these larger trials. Um, again, you might, these are bigger trials. You might see smaller groups uh, depending on the disease. So if it's a relatively rare disease or if it's an orphan drug, which is a drug targeted at a disease where there's really not a lot of research and development going on, you might see smaller groups. But um, you, in a common thing, like in these anticoagulation trials, looking at atrial fibrillation patients, you had 10 to 20,000 subjects in the trials. Once you complete your phase three, you can submit your new drug application. Uh, the FDA has about 60 days to decide whether or not it can be reviewed based on the completeness of the application. That's six to 10 months, depending on priority. The FDA can fast track things like if it's a, a drug for COVID, um, they could fast track that through and get it done more quickly. If it's another new antihypertensive medication, they're probably going to put it at the end of the line. So it depends on how relevant it is in today's uh, healthcare market um, as far as what type of impact it'll have on patients. And finally, there's post-marketing, which is technically phase four. And this is once the drug is on market, manufacturer is required to report certain checkpoints. So they do some post-marketing research and surveying and things like that. Um, the government has a process called MedWatch, which is uh, can be filled out by anyone. So if you have a patient who experiences a side effect that's kind of unusual, or maybe you work with a lot of diabetes patients in your clinic, and um, a number of them have uh, the same type of side effect that you're seeing to a specific drug uh, that's new to the market. There's a lot of new anti-diabetes um, uh, medications out. And so you could maybe start filling these MedWatch reports up to say, hey, I'm seeing the side effect. It's not really reported in the literature. I want to make sure that we know about it. So that happens too. And certainly, Regardless of how you look at how robust the phase three trials are, they're still short. So they might be a year, two years, maybe three years, but probably not that long. So you almost never know anything about long-term safety data, like 10, 20 years, what happens if you're developing a chronic medication and the person's supposed to take it for life, do we know how that affects them? And there's no way to know that in that phase. So that's a, a variable that could come up in post-marketing too at some point. Any questions about new drug development or anything like that so far? All right. Um, ANDAs are abbreviated new drug applications. So these are for approval of a generic medication. And um, all they have to do is prove bioequivalence, which means it gets to the same levels and has the same kinetics in the body as the original drug. They don't have to re-prove that their medication is um, effective in a patient population. So they're assuming that if you, um, you know, let's say, let's use warfarin, for example, if you're going to make a generic version of warfarin, we already proved in clinical trials that the compound warfarin itself works. So you don't have to do that again. You just have to make sure that your tablet is bioavailable. So when somebody takes it, it actually gets into their bloodstream, it gets absorbed, it gets absorbed at concentrations that are similar to the original product. Um, and you must come from a reputable manufacturer. So Chad's Drug Garage in Plymouth can't produce random pills. Like, well, I could if I had a license, I guess. Probably wouldn't get that, right? So um, uh, you have to have a reputable manufacturer that's gone through a number of different um, approval processes with the FDA itself. And I already talked about biosimilars a little bit. That's the biologic drugs that they're trying to mimic that, uh, again, are, have a lot of challenges with them. Over-the-counter medications. Um, a lot of times what we're seeing with over-the-counter medications now for anything that moves to over-the-counter, it's usually something that's prescription or existing prescription, and it gets approved to be used over-the-counter. So the drug company might make a case that this is safe, people can take this, people can self-medicate with this, um, and there's really no risk to it. One of the biggest examples recently are all the Harper medications, so Prilosec, Prevacid, 
um, those types of drugs, and also um, the steroid nasal sprays like Flonase, um, there's a number of other ones too. Those weren't um, generic when I was in school. So for example, just some of the stuff that's, or, sorry, those weren't over the counter when I was in school. Um, otherwise, stuff's just grandfathered in. It's interesting to see if a medication now, like you take aspirin, for example, been around forever. Um, is that really something that if they put it through, because um, what, what it's most used therapeutically for is, to, is an antiplatelet agent, right? So it puts platelets from vomiting together so people take it after heart attacks and things like that. Every other antiplatelet agent on the market is a prescription. So if aspirin came to the market now, the question is, would it actually get approval for OTC use? Probably not. Um, drugs with bleeding risk tend not to do that. <laughs> so it's sort of interesting that some of this stuff is just grandfathered in over time, and we can use it that way. Vitamins, minerals, supplements, natural products. I'll do a separate lecture on these specifically. The long, short story here, or the short story long, I should say, or long story short, however you want to look at it. Um, FDA uh, doesn't really have any authority over natural products, supplements, vitamins. They um, That was split by Congress a while ago. They used to. And then there's a law passed saying that the FDA didn't need to oversee these anymore. So um, vitamin companies can basically do whatever they want. There's really no oversight. Um, and there's no one... Unless the vitamin company is paying somebody to, um, like a third party, to review their products, there's no one saying that, yes, this capsule actually does contain a thousand micrograms of whatever, vitamin B12. Uh, whereas with a drug, um, an actual prescription medication or an OTC drug, they have to have that approved. They have to have studies on hand that say, yes, my 200 milligram ibuprofen tablet contains 190 to 210 milligrams or something like that. So. That's a little bit concerning. Again, we'll talk about that later, but um, the FDA doesn't have control over that particular market. Okay, so um, the average drug cost, could, to go back to drug pricing a little bit, the average drug costs about $4 billion to bring to market, and that goes up every year. That's It's an astronomical cost. Clinical trials are extremely expensive to coordinate. Um, about one in 10 products that a drug company starts investigating will actually make it to market. So every time you move to a different phase of clinical trial, you probably lose a lot of the investigational agents you're looking at. So a lot of drugs probably go into phase one. Um, a lot of them don't make it out of there because they're toxic or they, their kinetics don't make any sense. If you have to take the drug five times a day and it's not for some novel condition that we really need a new drug for, the FDA is going to say, we don't need that drug. Don't go back to the drawing board and figure something else out. But you already paid the money to the med chemists as a drug company to, to make that product, to, to develop it into some kind of a dosage form, to bring it to a small group of people and then done that trial with them. So that's certainly a huge investment from the drug company side of you. So that's where they say, you know, for every drug you make, you, you spend a lot more trying to, you know, you're recouping your costs on the back end with the, um, the actual drugs that get approved. But those are the drugs that are paying for the research for the new drugs to come to market. So that's where the drug companies will argue and lobby to their death that they need to be able to charge high prices for their medications. So anyway, that's just sort of the, the background on that whole argument and discussion. Uh, rising failure rates, again, uh, the small market, or small molecule drug market has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. There just aren't that many conditions where we're exploring small molecule drugs which are the big ones that drugs companies can make a lot of money off of. Yes, stuff comes out that's new, but the pipeline's relatively dry. So drug companies try and get creative. They try and you know repackage something that, that's existing, or maybe they convert an existing formulation into something that's extended release. So you take it twice a day originally, and now the new formulation comes out conveniently after the patent goes up, and now it's a once a day drug. So they do stuff like that to, to extend their, um, their market share and things like that. But it's it's more smoke and mirrors. I mean, it's sometimes beneficial. I won't say it's useless, but um, it's a lot of times, um, it's not like we're getting, again, we're not getting all these new interesting therapeutics to market. It's relatively few and far between. Um, I've alluded to this multiple times, but just to be clear, the U.S. has a pricing bubble. So um, drug companies rely on the U.S. Well, again, this is drug companies, what they say. They rely on the U.S paying in our share so that they can do R&D. Most other companies or countries, basically every other country in the world caps what drugs can be priced at. So if I'm a drug company, I'm trying to sell my product in Germany, German government says, yeah, you can't sell it for that. Sorry, you can. You want to sell this for $1,000 a month? How about 200? No? Okay, well, we'll, we'll take your competitor's product in. Um, so a lot of other company countries just simply say, no, um, we have the authority to tell you what you can charge for your medication, and that's it. You can sell it or not. 
the U.S. doesn't have anything like that. And so um, the U.S. is called considered a bubble in the system. So if everybody else is restricted, the U.S. is just sort of inflated. And again, the drug companies will argue that they need the U.S. to be inflated like that. Otherwise, they can't do R&D correctly. So you can read on it and debate it internally if you want, but that's all I'll say for now. Um, Direct-to-consumer advertising is is kind of, it's a really interesting and a point and a whole other topic in and of itself. But the U.S. and I think New Zealand, unless they got rid of it, were the only two countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer advertising from pharmaceutical companies. Some other countries allow it in various forms, like you might be able to, like in, in Germany, for example, you can advertise, as a drug company, you can advertise to have patients go into their primary to get discuss cholesterol medication or something like that. But you can't say what your drug is. So you can sort of get around that a little bit. But um, the, the drug companies pour a lot of money into their direct-to-consumer advertising, which has always seemed silly to me. I'm like, who actually would see, oh, I see Harvoni, you know, ad on TV. I might must go in right away and make sure I get checked for hep C. Like, I mean, does, it, does anyone actually think like that? But most people probably don't, but they, they wouldn't do it if it wasn't effective. So I don't think they'd dump millions of dollars into advertising if they weren't seeing some return on their business end. So it must be somewhat effective. I don't know. Anyway, we're sort of an anomaly that we can advertise for drugs. Uh, sustainability. Um, this I say this every year, and every year drug companies still survive. So it's, it's technically not sustainable. It's not sustainable to try and pump out all these drugs and spend all this money, and you're only getting so much return for your investment. But Again, the drug companies are smart businesses. They make a lot of money. They have shareholders, and they adapt. So I don't feel too bad for them in the long run. Um, we're a new drug company program, just in case you're curious about what countries, uh, companies are making new drugs. It's the U.S. by far and away. Um, not, no one's even close. All right, uh, research goals. So some other stuff to maybe think about for future things that might come out. Um, a lot of this is pie in the sky right now, but genomics. Genomics is, that's been, this has been touted as the next greatest thing since I was starting pharmacy school. And every time I hear it, it's always, oh, in five years, we're going to have so much genetic testing that we're going to be tailoring medication regimens for everyone in every disease state. I don't, I, I'm a skeptic that this will ever actually happen. There's a lot of things that are problematic with this. And maybe we'll probably get there at some point, right? But the point is, is that, well, the, the idea here with genomics is that you could, take somebody's genome and say, okay, well, these three antidepressants would work much better for you than these three because your body processes these three different than these three, or something like that. And there is some of that that exists right now. Most of it has to do with liver enzyme testing. So we can test for how well of a metabolizer you are with certain liver enzymes, and then we can look at what drugs are metabolized by those liver enzymes and try and match them up so you aren't, we aren't giving somebody a drug. Like if I'm a super metabolizer of CYP3A4 and you give me an antidepressant that's CYP3A4 metabolized, my body just chews it up, I get no clinical benefit out of it. Or you have to give me a massive dose that causes side effects. So maybe there's another one in the same class that's metabolized differently you can give me that doesn't go through that pathway that I can use that's going to work a lot better for me. So those are sort of the ideas with genomics right now. As far as applications to genomics, there's very few. The one, one that's probably most regularly used, if you remember to the kinetics lecture from last week, I talked about the drug Plavix or clopidogrel. It's a prodrug. It's metabolized into its active form. There is some genetic testing for that where we can identify people who aren't able to metabolize that drug from its prodrug form to its active form. Because this is, like, when it comes to cardiology, people don't mess around. People want sure answers and, and evidence. Um, that's one of the, the, the rules of cardiology medicine. So um, you have a drug that you're requiring people to take post-MI and post a number of other things. So if you've had a myocardial infarction, you're going to be on an antiplatelet agent, or maybe two. And if um, if that doesn't work, you're going to end up back in the cath lab getting another stent placed, or even worse, dead. Um, so they really want to make sure that that drug works. So there's been a lot of genetic research into that particular product, so we can test to see if people are able to metabolize clopidogrel properly. And if you aren't, they'll pick a different agent. We'll talk more about that um, uh, in two modules from now in the CARDS module this fall, but just as an example of what we do do with genomics. But that's probably the only one that's routinely done right now. There's other ones that are done, but it's controversial whether they actually work. There's some companies that claim to do this kind of stuff, but whether they really have a lot of FDA approval for what they're offering is a little bit gray. So take it with a grain of salt. 
Uh, large database screening, so we can look at big data. We, we're getting into the era where we have massive quantities of data to come through. So especially in countries that are more socialized medicine, like in Europe, where they have just access to hundreds of thousands of data points for people taking medications, you can go through these and you know connect dots in different ways. Now, correlation doesn't equal causation, right? So you have to do more research into that. But looking at large databases, saying, hey, all these people take this drug for blood pressure, but we pulled a subset of people out who also have depression and found that all their depression um, their depression scores were higher than a subset of people who didn't take it. So stuff like that gets looked at and you say, well, maybe it makes sense to use these medications in people with depression who also have hypertension, something like that. Um, one of the big things we're seeing right now is a lot of the new um, anti-diabetic medications on market are going for um, cardio-positive benefit, like they improve mortality benefits in heart failure patients, stuff like that. So that's a big crossover that they're looking at right now too. So that stuff comes to market where, you know, we had a drug used for this and now it's being used for another purpose. It's not really new or anything like that, but it does help with certain disease state management if you can prove that it's useful in certain populations. Talked about the biologic versus small molecule. Me Too is just a drug company strategy to say, hey, everybody else is making a new um, anticoagulant. I'm going to make one too. Because it's not that hard to figure out, here's the molecule they're using, I'll alter it a little bit. And a lot of times the research, it all sort of comes out at one time. Like you'll have three new drugs in the same class that hit the market within a couple year time period. Do they collaborate? I don't know exactly how that works. <laughs> it's always sort of um, baffled me that they can do all that within the same time period. Active enantiomers. This is a really... Um, age-old way that drug companies repackage a product. So um, they'll take the existing drug that's been on the market for 10 years, and once it starts to lose its patent, what they do is they bring the active enantiomer out. So like the good example of this, citalopram was a brand name Lexapro. is an antidepressant that was probably the most popular on the market for a number of years. And when it lost its patent, the drug company said, hey, look what I've got, S citalopram, um, which is exactly what it sounds, the S enantiomer of citalopram, which is actually the more potent version. And so they dose it a little bit less, but it works maybe a little bit better. I don't know. <laughs> it's basically the same thing. But now guess which one's the most popular on the market? S citalopram. So now they're both generic, so it doesn't really matter. But you'll see that happen a lot with drug companies where they, they bring a new, new drug to market that's really just a, a slightly more active version of the old one. So how does this affect you? Um, substitution and generic substitution and what you can prescribe is often dictated on certain levels by what the insurance company will allow you to do. So in the hospital setting or inpatient setting, kind of do whatever you want because it's all lumped into one bill. So we have a formulary. So if you try to prescribe something in the hospital, I'll call you and say, hey, we don't stock this medication, but this is our formulary substitution. Take it or leave it. Um, so if you try and do that on the outpatient setting, um, you might send a prescription over to your pharmacy and then they come back and say, this isn't covered by the insurance. The insurance wants you to try this drug or they might say you need a prior authorization, which is when you call the insurance company or send something into the insurance company that's documenting that you've tried maybe a couple other drugs in the class or they failed the drugs or they had side effects of the drugs or something. It's actually a lot easier than you think. Well, not that you I know you don't think it's easy, but because you've probably never done this before, but um, it sounds complicated, but it's actually not that bad. Um, we have a we have a tech that works in our hospital. She does, specifically works with our um, cardiology department, and she gets her job is just to get PAs done for people. So if somebody started on some new expensive medication inpatient, the last thing you want to do is get ready for discharge and have the insurance reject that dispense because it's or the patient be like, I can't afford a five hundred dollar a month cash payment. Pick something else. So what she does is she'll try and identify those patients early so that that's all taken care of and they get switched to the right agent or they get a prior authorization in place and done by the time they discharge. So we've tried some of those strategies. On the outpatient setting, it's easier. Call your pharmacy before you prescribe something new. I would just always do it and just, it's really easy to run a test claim on somebody's insurance. So I can go in, a pharmacy tech, pharmacist can go into their system and I can process a dummy claim and just run it through like it's gonna actually be a real thing and it'll tell me what it costs. And if you wanna go through with it, we can just fill it. If not, I'll just reverse the claim with insurance. It's literally like two clicks. It's really easy to do. So that's certainly something to, to not forget about, especially if you're like, then I don't wanna prescribe this new expensive medication. This person has cost prohibitive issues or um, you know, they're already on several meds and um, they're, they're kind of at their max budget. 
um, you want to be conscious of that. If the patient can't afford the medication, they aren't going to take it, and it's useless at that point. So you want to do your homework on some of these things, especially the 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 rule of the thumb here is anything new, anything new to market, anything that's still brand name, there's always a risk that you're going to get that rejected from your insurance company or the patient's insurance company. <sighs> Drug shortages. Drug shortages are an ongoing issue that didn't exist really 10 years ago. It's really odd and I'm not entirely sure. There's a lot of complicating factors, but companies just run out of medication. So we'll have plenty of drug for you know five years and all of a sudden it's like, hey, this one generic manufacturer pulled out of market or maybe there's only one person that made it and the, all their product was recalled. And all of a sudden you can't find something really common anywhere on the shelf. Um, and so that happens a lot in the drug world. Or uh, a good example recently is, you know, you get um, some early data in, in kind of last spring that was showing hydroxychloroquine, which is now all over the news. So you guys probably heard of this by now. But people are saying, well, hydroxychloroquine might be beneficial for COVID. We didn't really know because it wasn't studied, but maybe. Um, so everyone in the world bought up as much hydroxychloroquine as you can. Our hospital bought like 20,000 doses, something absurd. Um, so did we use any of it? No. <laughs> so the problem is, is people who are already on hydroxychloroquine for other indications like rheumatoid arthritis, and there's a couple other things it's used for, not commonly, but still used by some people, um, couldn't get a hold of it because everybody else and their mom was buying it up. Um, and people were prescribing it inappropriately and all kinds of junk was happening. So that's one example of something that happens, you know, upstream in the market that affects a lot of people. Or like um, two years ago, Another good example, there's a hurricane in Port that wiped out, you know, Puerto Rico got hit really bad with a hurricane. And guess who manufactures all the IV solutions that basically supply the world in Puerto Rico? Baxter. Baxter is one of the biggest suppliers of dextrose and normal saline and stuff like that. So I had lots of drug. I had antibiotic vials. I couldn't mix it with anything because I didn't have solutions, which is crazy to think about that I didn't have salt water. But I didn't. So that's again something that happens from time to time. That just it ripples in the market, and we see it a lot more now than I did in the beginning of my career. And I haven't been a pharmacist for that long, so it's just um, just something you have to live with. So sometimes you might get a call saying, "Yeah, that's on shortage right now." It's a really common way that we talk, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and we do our best to pivot in these situations to offer alternatives, figure out other options. It's a lot of work, but uh, you, we do the best we can to make sure patients are still getting medications. Okay, uh, just a little bit more about generic substitution. Uh, any pharmacy, retail pharmacy, can legally substitute generic products unless prescribed by you is what's called DAW or dispense as written. Um, so if you want brand name whatever, you have to put dispense as written on there. And you'll probably get a call back from the pharmacist saying, I don't have this product, one, because this has been generic for years, and two, um, it's really expensive. The patient's going to pay a $300 copay. Is she okay? He or she okay with that? So those are things to consider when you're prescribing that. Otherwise, if you put the brand name on a prescription, the pharmacy will automatically dispense generic if they can. They don't call you or ask you about that, again, unless it's DAW. Remember, generic products, the, uh, the actual active ingredient is identical to the brand product. And there's, they're processed by facilities that are held to the same standard as brand manufacturers. In fact, a lot of brand manufacturers, like Pfizer, owns a lot of different subsidiaries. And um, some of them make generics, some make brands, some probably make both. It doesn't really matter. It's all kind of the same pool where they're pulling from. Some companies are certainly just generic, but a lot of brand products own their, their own subsidiaries too. So it's not like you're getting a subpar factory making your drugs. These factories are, and manufacturing facilities are held to ridiculously high standards for cleanliness, cross-contamination, things like that. Um, you might have different what's called excipient ingredients in the actual tablet or the, the compound, whatever it means. And excipient ingredient is something that's not active. So you might have, you know, 10 milligrams of lisinopril, and if you look at the brand and the generic, um, they both have 10 milligrams of lisinopril in them, but one has more, slightly more lactose than the other one. Lactose is usually the binder they use. Um, and then you get into the, the tricky thing about, well, what about people who need to be lactose-free or gluten-free? Because sometimes gluten products are used in, as binders for the tablet itself. Um, there are web websites like that. I think there's one called glutenfreedrugs.com, actually. Um, sounds sketchy, but it's, it's legit. Some pharmacist compiles it somewhere in the country. I can't remember exactly the details, but um, lactose is a little trickier. Probably not enough lactose in pills to make a difference in somebody's diet, but um, patients will be the judge of that, and you might hear about that every once in a while. It's very difficult to eliminate some of these things from people's medication regimen. So um, 
I've gotten questions about this and you end up looking through inserts to figure out what exactly the excipient ingredients are because they're all published and available. It's just a matter of finding something that actually meets that criteria can be really tricky. Um, generics, again, much less money. Usually one thing to remember about generics is once a drug comes to market, it's going to take a little bit of time to see the savings. So drug companies usually have like, sometimes they have like a buffer window um, of like six months to a year where they can still charge the same for their for their um, whole price. Or what's more commonly seen is um, they get some kind of a deal with the FDA where the FDA says, okay, Pfizer, your Lipitor is going generic next month. Um, you get an exclusive deal to use your generic subsidiary manufacturer to price and make lisinopril for six months. Uh, how did they get that? I don't know. It's just part of the deal, I guess. Um, and so but sometimes you'll see something that's generic, and it actually is the exact same pill as the brand, but it's just the brand company is now making the generic, so it's really silly, and it's basically the same price. But then once all the other companies can come in and make their generic equivalent, that's where you start to see the competition, and then the price drops substantially usually. Um, brand versus generic names and speaking, I'm terribly guilty of this, and I, I cross my, my brands and generics a lot because that's what people do in real life, unfortunately. I try to keep within all the generics, but there's some things where it's just really easy to see the brand name. So I apologize if I, if I mix those up, and if I ever do, feel free to correct me or clarify what I'm talking about. Um, for you guys communicating with nurses or other healthcare professionals, um, just make sure that you're being very clear on what it is because there are lookalikes, soundalikes that um, make it tricky to understand what people want. So like one thing that, that I was, that I'm super used to now, but it just got me, it made me feel really weird when I first started practicing is there's a medication called norepinephrine, which is a really common vasopressor that they give people who are in septic shock or something like that. So it's always an emergency thing. So the brand name of norepinephrine is Levofed. And so people will call the pharmacy and say, Hey, I need a Levo to OR 13 staff. Huh, hang up. Like if you didn't really know what Levo is, you're like, what Levo, Levothyroxine, Levo, Loxacin, there's a million drugs that start with the name Levo. So what does that mean? It's always better just to not try and be cool and use the brand name, even though we all do that, um, but just to say, hey, can I get a norepinephrine drip to Aura 13? It takes one more second to say that, and you're very clear on what exactly you need. Okay, um, so insurance, I already kind of talked about all this. I'm not going to really rehash it at this point, but... Uh, basically, insurance prefer generics. They want to save money in two, and then if they don't have to pay for brand, they're going to make more money. So that's basically all it comes down to. If you want something, prior authorization. That's about it. Um, pharmacies. So pharmacies charge uh, based on product price, plus they add usually some dispensing fee to it. So if you've ever been, you know, got, I remember one time I got like six 800 milligram ibuprofen and I got my wisdom teeth removed, and it cost me like $12. Well, those pills, because I worked in a pharmacy at that time, cost like 12 cents. So that costs money because a pharmacy is going to charge you for a dispensing fee regardless. So if you dispense an empty vial at a pharmacy, that costs money in processing and all that stuff and, and labor and whatnot. So that's why you'll see sometimes really cheap stuff still costs something cash. Even if it's like those pills are pennies, yes, but it costs money to, to process them and everything like that. Some companies offer $4 generics, which are really nice for patients on who don't have insurance. Um, and finding that list is, is really easy on like Target's website or Walgreens' website or whatever. Um, that isn't a sustainable practice. The only reason Tar Green, Target and Walgreens can do that is because they have enough volume to be able to support that type of a model. An independent pharmacy won't offer $4 generics because they can't afford to do that. They're losing money every time they process a $4 generic. So anyway, that's all I have to say in case you're wondering about price. Um, I said this something like this earlier, but I had this professor, and, and you might see this guy on the news every once in a while. He's kind of like the go-to like pharmacy policy dude at the U of M. His name's Stephen Schondelmeyer, and he he had he likes to quote himself in lectures. So here I am quoting him. <laughs> um, but this is one quote he put in his own lecture. Uh, he says, "A drug is not that one cannot afford is neither safe nor effective." It sort of resonated with me. If somebody can't afford the medication, they can't take it and um, there's no therapeutic benefit to it. So we have to make sure if you're going to prescribe something and you're convinced that it's going to have a therapeutic benefit, which should be if you're prescribing it, right? But you got to make sure that the patient can afford it. So sometimes we do have to play a little bit of a social worker role um, to make sure that we can get that um, straightened out for the patient so that they have a clear pathway to be able to pay for that medication, pick up that medication, and afford the medication. So taking cost into consideration is always important, and being a wise steward of your 
healthcare dollars and your pharmacy dollars is, is always good. Just like anything in healthcare, we want to try and use the less expensive option if it's going to be just as good as a more expensive option. All right, a couple more random topics. Um, so controlled substances in general, we'll talk about controlled substances for sure. So I'll point them out what they are. Good idea just to know what what is controlled and what isn't. Um, there's not a lot of them, um, and a lot of them fall into two ma a couple major categories, so it's a little bit easy to figure that out. But there's certainly some oddballs out there that come to market, and you're like, why is this controlled? Well, it just it is. <laughs> so basically, if um, something was uh, proved in a clinical trial and somebody reported that they felt euphoric or lightheaded or altered mental status or something like that on it, even if it was a small amount of people, the FDA or the DEA will usually require it to be slapped on some sort of control status. So there's control status five through two. And what it means is the, the lower the control status. So C2 is, um, there is a C1. C1 is something that doesn't have any technical medical benefit. So like, uh, what's this example of a C1? Mar marijuana or cannabis in, in most states is a C1. Federally, I should say, is a C1, um, even though it's highly debated, right? So that's a bad example, but it is a C1. Um, what's me Well, methamphetamine isn't actually a C1. It's a C2 because there is a drug called methamphetamine. It's not really used, but technically there is one. There's a lot of stimulants kind of like methamphetamine that are used, and those are all C2s too. Uh, cocaine is not a C1. Cocaine is a C2 because we use topical cocaine for nosebleeds. It's a vasoconstrictant, so we use a really dilute solution, kind of swab it externally, and it's a numbing agent and it stops bleeding. So a lot of drugs of abuse you might think of as C1s are not actually. Um, MDMA or ecstasy, that's a C1. So stuff like that would be C1s, but not all illicit drugs are C1s, so I want to be clear about that. Um, C3 through 5s everything else. So C5 means it's got the lowest potential of abuse. C2, highest potential of abuse. So all of our opioid medications are C2s. C5s are weird things like some anti-epileptic drugs have C5 on them. Um, like codeine cough syrup is a C5, even though it's very highly abused. So it doesn't always make sense, but anyway, that's the way it is. Um, they all essentially have the same restrictions around them, with the exception of C2s are a little bit more stringent on how many refills you can give. You can't give any refills for C2s, whereas you can give six months worth of refills for C3 through 5. Um, so if you have somebody chronically taking like uh, Ritalin or Adderall and they've been on it for years and it's safe and it's working for them and you want to keep prescribing it, you can't prescribe them a year's worth of Ritalin at a time. You have to prescribe them. Um, so sometimes what they'll do is providers will write out multiple prescriptions at once and the patient kind of brings it in. Sometimes you can authorize 90, 90 days, and certain states will allow that, depending on the rule with some of those things. I think Minnesota does allow that for some stimulants, but C2s are a little more restrictive than that. C3 through 5, again, six months worth of refills, um, and those are going to be like uh, benzodiazepines, sleep medication, so things like Ativan, Xanax, um, Valium, Ambien, those are all like C4s, so that's what falls into those categories most commonly. The Minnesota PMP is the prescription monitoring program. It's something that um, I recommend everyone sign up with once you're in practice or on, even if you're on your rotations, you might be able to access it too. It's a really handy tool that pulls in um, controlled substance dispenses throughout the state. And there's a lot of states that also have a PMP that you can pull in data as well. So you can pull in surrounding states, which helps if you know, you're know you worried about somebody who lives in Wisconsin who's in your ER and you know doc thinking maybe doctor shopping around the cities or something like that. Um, you get uh, you can search basically just name and date of birth, and then you can look at their prescription um, history with controlled substances. There's some things in there that are non-controlled, too, because certain people lobby for certain things, like, for example, gabapentin is a medication used for neuropathy. It was kind of a weak anti-epileptic drug. Um, I don't know if it, people claim it has a p abuse potential and that it should be controlled. It's not currently. And so that's one that actually reports in the PMP, even though it's not a controlled substance. So sometimes you see stuff like that people will try to get into uh, the PMP. Yeah. Is this like the CURES report? Is that like a national thing? Or? I don't know what Maybe that that's is. Just California. Maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, other states might have a different name for it. Is there like a national or a state? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a national debate database that I know that you can tap into directly, but like I can go into the Minnesota PMP and I can pull in California if I want to. So I think they're all connected, but not directly. You can't just search the whole U.S. You'd have to pull it. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. So um, again, a useful tool. It's really useful too if you're just wondering, like, you know, what's the last prescription this person got? Maybe you have somebody who can't, who's not 
a good historian or doesn't know, you know, maybe they're taking controlled substances and you want to confirm exactly what they took and you don't have any other information, it's a good way just to check that out too. Um, you don't need any reason to go into this as a provider or a pharmacist even. Um, if I'm dispensing medications, I can go into that under my license and say, you know what, I'm just double checking this. And I highly recommend you double check it. Just, it's okay to feel like you're doing the, you know, you're doing your due diligence without patron, you know, like talking down to the patient or anything like that. And that's where it's nice where you don't actually have to ask them for permission because like, hey, you know, I think you're doctor shopping. Can I, uh, can I look into your history here? No, you can just go and do that without it. And it doesn't like send them a message saying, so-and-so looked into your uh, PMP report. So it's all, you know, private on both sides there. Um, but all pharmacies are required to report to it. So um, that is something that legally they have to do. So all the stuff should be in there. And again, it's a really helpful tool. And any, anytime you feel that, that little bit of apprehension to why somebody's there, you know, it's, it's not a bad idea just to look at it and make sure your bases are covered. Uh, it's really easy to see if you're in there too. You'll see like, if somebody gets the same oxycodone filled every month by the same provider, picks it up at the same pharmacy, you can see that really clearly. You can also see if somebody's gone to six different providers with six different pharmacies really quickly. So there'll be clear patterns that you'll see in it. All right, um, drug shortages, I talked about this. Um, if you're wondering if something is on shortage or if there's an alternate recommendation, um, ASHP is the American Society of Health System Pharmacy that keeps a really good um, comprehensive shortage database. So just in case you're curious or you run into that. Um, economic implications, <laughs> again, um, there's, there's interesting things happen where a manufacturer pulls out or a, a raw material goes on shortage and somebody can't make it anymore. So it ends up being, you know, all of a sudden there's only one generic manufacturer on the market for a particular drug. And that manufacturer has free reign to charge whatever they want at that point. There is no restriction for what somebody can charge for a generic medication. So do you guys remember Martin Shirkelly, whatever that guy, Shirkelly, I think that guy's name, they call him the Pharma Bro or something like that. Um, he, he went to jail for defrauding his investors, but um, he, uh, he was notorious for taking a drug called uh, Delphiprim, yeah, and it's, it's a really obscure medication that's like a prophylactic or HIV treatment for opportunistic infections, it's like fourth line, it's rarely ever used, but no one was making it, so his drug company bought it and was, took a drug that was like pennies and was charging like 700 bucks a, a treatment course for it, so people didn't like him for that. But that's actually completely legal to do. What he didn't do was tell his investors correct information, apparently, and that's why he went to jail. So interesting uh, ways we deal with things in this country sometimes. <laughs> uh, references and walkthroughs. I get a lot of questions about what's a good reference to use, what do you recommend. Uh, sometimes it depends on what you have access to, uh, what you want to pay for a reference. But there's a couple things I'd recommend at least having some kind of app on your smartphone that you can access that gives you basic information. Um, Epocrates is one that's free, at least there's a free version of it. I'm not advertising for them, but they do have a decent amount of basic information. It doesn't really go in depth on their free version, so it's not going to give you all the nuanced information like an Alexicomp or a Micromedics would. These things are usually, if you buy them, buy them by the for, the, for your own personal use, if you purchase them, they're quite expensive. Most people have access to them through an institution, though. So I don't know if Bethel buys any of these, but certainly um, the hospitals you're on rotation with or, or clinics or whatever systems you're working with will likely have a, a subscription to something like this. And you can, it's really easy. Like, for example, up to date, you guys are familiar with up to date, anyone? It's like a Wikipedia for healthcare, it's cool. Um, up to date links LexiComp, which is a drug database. So all the drugs within up to date are LexiComp information. So it's a really good, solid resource for all things, you know, medical or pharmacy related. And you can get that on your an app on your phone. All, all I have to do with Alina is like log into the app on Alina and then I just link it to my smartphone. It's super easy to do. So if you do an Alina rotation, you'll get access to that. I imagine other sites do the same thing there. Um, Sanford Guide is really great for infectious disease. Um, a lot of sites, again, will have this online. It's easy to access that way. Um, but there, this is one thing that, I know they always used to hand out at um, conventions and trade shows and stuff like that, which don't really exist in this current market. But um, it does show you exactly like all the bugs you're looking at, what drugs cover them, and there's some um, different uh, algorithms that they put in there too. But it's really nice if you're like, oh, I've got this resistant pathogen. All my first line choices are either out because of resistance or allergies. Now, what do I do? Well, you go to Sanford 
look at your bug and then kind of scroll down and see what's what's an option and then maybe you can figure out if that would be appropriate for that particular treatment or not. Uh, all right. Natural Medicines Database is a, a website that's I think maintained by the government um, and it's just got a, a resource of natural medicine. So if you're wondering why somebody might take um, I don't know, what's over here? Cinnamon. Uh, why does somebody take cinnamon capsules? Well, they could give you a whole bunch of reasons on there. Um, so you might see some of the more common things, any reported toxicities or side effects you would find on there too. Otherwise, you don't really see that stuff on some of these other resources. Um, GlobalRPH.com is a, a sort of sketchy looking website. It's got a lot of ads on it, but it's actually pretty legit and there's a lot of good calculators on there. So um, like for um, electrolyte replacement, um, kidney function, that type of stuff. There's a lot of quick calculators you can use on there. Guidelines, uh, that's kind of a silly thing to put on here, but obviously guidelines are sort of the end-all be-all when it comes to recommendations, especially in certain uh, arenas of medicine. So being able to look at guidelines, look at the quick summaries of the guidelines and interpret them, look at their charts and flow charts and algorithms, that's going to be your best bet for getting to the source. Now. Up to date, we'll reference guidelines, but if you really want to read it yourself, which I recommend you do, especially the first time you, you treat something, not read the whole guidelines, no one does that, but at least go through some of the summaries and, and charts and stuff and, and look into some of that information. Uh, PubMed literature is obviously, you can search literature, you can read, um, a lot of times I find myself getting asked really bizarre questions and I'm just, I'm looking at some weird study where somebody had a side effect once to a medication, because I don't know, I've got a few providers that like to come to me and say, well, um, this person's here with this side effect. Look over their whole med list and see if any of their meds could cause it. Ah. <laughs> I hate these kind of things because usually it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And you find like one case report where somebody had something similar and you're like, well, I got this. It's, I don't know. And they're like, oh, okay, thanks. It's probably not that anyway. I'm like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> glad, I, glad I put the time in. No, I'm not trying to be mean to my providers. They're really good. But <laughs> um, it's just a matter of... Uh, sometimes you just do have to dig into those extra like one-off cohort case studies and things like that to figure some of this stuff out because you, you'll encounter weird stuff that isn't in a you look at the common drug side effects of something and it's just it's not listed there my dad's notorious for this every time he gets prescribed something he calls me up and he's like oh, I have this side effect is it, I was googling and people say this happens with this drug I'm like I've never heard of that <laughs> so I don't know what to tell you um, but Anyway, there's a lot of other drug references out there. Certainly, this, this isn't limited. These are just the ones that, um, I, for the most part, I pretty much just use up-to-date LexiComp. I use Micromedics for some things. Micromedics is uh, just more or less a drug database. It doesn't have any other stuff in it. It's really good for more nursing functions, too. Like, can you run two IVs in the same lab? Stuff like that is in Micromedics, which is really helpful, but not necessarily as much for you as for me and the nurses. So. Um, yeah, that's basically it for drug references. If you find something really good and want to share it with your colleagues, go for it. I'm sure there's other stuff out there now or maybe other apps other than Hippocrates that are free and, and relatively good, but those are the ones I know of that are pretty well vetted. All right. So that's my introduction. You have the kinetics lecture, you have the